This is rental car number 124. Today I'm driving the 2019 Nissan Sentra SV. This is a compact car that seats five and retails eh, for around $19,000. At least that's what Nissan's website says. I bet you can get this for a much better price. Anyway, Nissan's been making the Sentra since 1982, and this is the seventh generation of the vehicle, so it's been around for a while now. This one has 16-inch 10-spoke aluminum alloy wheels, and under the hood we have a 1.8-liter four-cylinder engine. It's got Nissan's Xtronic CVT. That's a continuously variable transmission with overdrive. You got 124 horsepower out of this thing, which, you know, isn't too bad. And uh, because you don't have a tremendous amount of power, you get some pretty good gas mileage. 29 miles per gallon in the city, 37 on the highway. This thing has a 13.2 gallon fuel tank. Gas by me has gone up considerably in the last month or so, so it's now $2.99 a gallon in the Chicago suburbs. So that means you can fill this thing up by me for around $40. All right, so that's a lot of numbers and specs. Let's talk about what it's actually like to drive this car, and I wanna start with acceleration. Uh, first off, acceleration is fine. Look, I couldn't find any reliable 0 to 60 numbers online, but in my experience, it was around 9 to 10 seconds. So, it's not a super fast car, but there's really nothing wrong with the acceleration on the Sentra. You gotta remember, you're only getting about 124 horsepower, so this thing is built, well, for miles per gallon more than it is for speed. Uh, but I didn't have any issues over the course of the two days that I drove this car, and I never felt like I needed more speed than the car was giving me. But if you're looking for something super fast, you might want to look elsewhere at this price point. I also didn't have any major issues with handling. I, I felt comfortable turning at high speeds and also comfortable parking the car. And it's overall, it's pretty responsive and it hugs the road well. So handling wise, I had no issues at all. The only issue I had was probably cabin noise and it's a minor issue, but at high speeds, I did find that I had to turn up the volume by about 10 15% just to hear what was going on in my audiobooks, my podcasts, but that's really not a deal breaker for me. So cabin noise is good, handling is good, and acceleration is fine, but uh, just take all that with a grain of salt because, well, I'm not the pickiest driver out there, so I can tolerate quite a bit before I start to complain. Here's the key fob, Nissan standard fob, uh, an oval shape with nothing on the back and four buttons on the front, lock, unlock, a uh, trunk release right here, and then a panic button. Because you get a key fob without a physical key, you also get a push button start. It's right here on the dash, and when it turns on, it kind of illuminates in a soft red color. Here's the steering wheel setup. You got a toggle switch right here to adjust things on the center display right there, and a source button to cycle through the radio, XM radio, and also Bluetooth connectivity. Down below there, we have a volume control right here, and then an additional menu button right here to interact with the screen in the gauge cluster. On the right-hand side, we have our voice assistant button, along with a phone button to answer and hang up phone calls, and then your cruise controls right here. Up above, we have a, a nice gauge cluster. Pretty big dials, RPMs on the left, and a speedometer on the right with a fuel gauge down here, and a temperature gauge down in here, and then a pretty nice big screen in the center. Um, if you'll notice, you get a clock. It says it's 2.12 a.m. Trust me, it's not 2.12 a.m. right now, but you get a clock in the upper left-hand corner. Uh, it tells you what temperature it is outside the vehicle up top. And then right now I have it on the driver assistant aid screen. So it just kind of tells you what technology is active to help you driving. This one will give you an indication if you're getting too close to the vehicle in front of you, if that vehicle is slowing down. It just kind of beeps at you to let you know uh, that you need to pay attention and probably stop the vehicle. Let me see if I can cycle through a couple other screens for you. And I'm just pressing this button right here. No warnings on the vehicle, which is a good thing because it's brand new. You'll notice down here you have the odometer showing that it's only got about 7,000 miles on it. Also, we're in park, just in case you're curious. And we got about uh, 500 miles until the uh, gas tank runs empty. So I'm going to keep pressing this button right here. We have a menu structure right here that we can cycle through using this button. Not a whole lot of interesting stuff here, but it is pretty easy to find things. I'm just pushing up and down on this and then pushing it in to either select or deselect an option. But let's keep going. You also have uh, average speed, 
trip counter, second trip counter, fuel economy, audio, and then we're back to driving aids. So some pretty decent screens here. It is a really nice crisp screen, so it makes it kind of enjoyable while you're driving to glance down and see a little bit of information on the vehicle right here. To the left, we have our window controls along with uh, the locks. Up top, we have a door lock right here and a nice chrome door latch. Up on the dash, we have uh, the buttons to turn on and off eco mode, traction control on and off, a uh, button right here to adjust the brightness of the display up there in the gauge cluster, mirror controls, and then a uh, trunk release. And all the way down here, we also have releases for both the gas cap and the hood. And we also have the side view mirrors. No blind side detection on this vehicle, but uh, I mean, it's a pretty small car, so I don't think you really need that technology. And both mirrors look uh, pretty much identical. Up top, we have uh, lights, along with a pretty simple control to uh, adjust whether or not the lights are gonna turn on or not if you open a car door. You have a large sunglass holder. And down below there, we have a simple rear view mirror, no buttons of any kind on it. Just a simple toggle switch. And you'll notice there are no garage door buttons anywhere on this vehicle, even up here on the sunshade. So you will actually have to carry around a physical garage door opener if, if you're lucky enough to have a house that has one of those. Down below there, we have our hazard button, along with your airbag for the passenger indicator right here. Two vents, and then a pretty nice screen right here. It is a touch screen. It's got dedicated buttons down here to adjust through what I would consider all the important uh, features, right? We can go to our connectivity screen. I'm connected via Bluetooth right now. We can go to the phone screen. There's quite a bit here. You can uh, see your text messages, your phone book, your call history. And then our settings screen and our info screen. Actually, I haven't looked at the info screen yet, so let's take a look. System information. Yeah, that's pretty boring stuff. Just the software updates, vehicle data information. Wow, we can transmit recorded vehicle data to Nissan. Sure, it's a rental car, I don't mind. But it doesn't look like there's anything really interesting to play around with. I think you do get dedicated buttons on the left-hand side to go to the uh, main menu button, cycle through uh, whether it's going to play through the uh, radio, XM radio, or through your Bluetooth connectivity. You can adjust the track right here, a back button. And then right here is, I think, one of my favorite features. It's just a simple button to quickly adjust the brightness of the display. So you have one setting for day and one setting for night. And then a nice dial right With here. With live music starting. To adjust the volume and turn on and off the audio. Uh, this has worked pretty well. I don't know why, but I always have trouble with Nissans and connecting my phone via Bluetooth. The initial setup is really easy, but I find that uh, I have to reset my phone a lot because I'll lose connectivity with the vehicle. It might just be because I'm using a cheap cell phone, but I thought it was worth mentioning. Down below there we have our climate controls, nice digital dials to show you exactly what temperature the car is set at, simple controls to adjust how hot or cold the vehicle is. Big buttons to adjust the uh, defrost settings, and then a nice sort of circular, I guess you could say, control in the center to adjust the fan, and then what direction the vents are blowing. Uh, this works great. I didn't have any issues with it at all, and uh, even though it's getting a little warmer, I still use the heat, and uh, I was able to get the car to a comfortable temperature pretty quickly. Behind there is the gear shift. You got a rubbery material right here to help you grip it, and then it's kind of shiny and got a nice plastic on top. Shift through the gears pretty easily, and then you actually have an overdrive button on the side. Let me move that out of the way. You have a small storage cutout right here, along with a power port to the left. Another storage cutout right here. This is where I've been keeping my cell phone. Also a manual parking brake. Two cup holders right here. And then you have a small center armrest. Uh, it's got a nice leather on top. It opens up really easily. Inside we have an auxiliary jack and a USB port and then a little bit of space here to store some additional items. And then the glove box is on the passenger side. Pretty decent size. It's got some nice depth to it. You'll see we have all the owner's manuals shoved in here and there's still plenty of room. So uh, you should be able to haul around your own owner's manual, your registration materials, and maybe some additional stuff in here. Uh, pretty easily. 
All right, so I jumped in the back seat, and uh, on small cars like this, I like to push the driver's seat all the way back when I'm looking at legroom in the back seat. So that's what I've done. And despite being six feet tall and having the seat pushed all the way back, I still have two or three inches between my knees and the back of that seat, which is uh, it's pretty good to see. No pockets of any kind on the back of the driver's seat, but you do get a small pocket on the back of the passenger seat. Not a ton of room, but it's always nice to have additional storage. On the back of the center armrest for the front seat passengers, we have two storage cutouts and then two USB ports at the bottom. Although, I would note these are both of different sizes, which is the first I've seen on any 2019, so that's kind of interesting. Not a whole lot of other amenities, just your standard uh, window controls and door locks. Up top we do have a handle. We also have a center armrest. Oh, kind of tight. Folds down to reveal two cup holders, and then Let's take a look at the car seat anchors. Wow, look at this. This is one of my pet peeves. I hate it when car seat anchors are buried, but these are, uh, well, you can find them without even manipulating the seats at all. They're sticking out, so it should be very easy to install a car seat back here. All right, so let's close things out by taking a look at the trunk. Um, not a rectangular shape. That's usually my preference because it makes it easier to get suitcases and larger items back here. So those wheel wells do infringe on the space back here a little bit, but that's probably to be expected because this isn't a huge car. It's a small compact. Uh, so there's enough room back here, I think, to haul around what you need to on a daily basis. Under the floor of this area, you also get a spare tire, which is always a great thing. And it's also great that those rear seats do fold down. You just have to pull up on these little pins right here, and the uh, seats fold down without really any effort at all. It doesn't take any muscle. Um, I would note, however, that that space, that little tunnel way between the actual trunk and the cabin of the vehicle, is quite small. So getting larger items through the trunk and into the cabin of the vehicle might be a little bit more difficult. But it's great to know that if you do need to haul around something a little bit larger, uh, at least you can. All right, so that's pretty much everything end to end on the 2019 Nissan Sentra SV. I was glad I got this car. I, I don't think I got a chance to review it in 2018, so it was nice to see the 2019 on my docket. Anyway, after two days and about 160 miles, I'm going to give this one three stars. And that's a three stars with a little bit of love in there because I do like the Sentra quite a bit. I just think at $19,000, you could probably get something a little faster and something with a little bit more technology. Anyway, that's just my opinion. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope you'll join me next time when I rent and review my 125th rental car. I'll see you then.